Episode 665. Book talk begins at 11 minutes and 51 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 665, Paint and Picking. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely subscribers and patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and over in our channel memberships at YouTube, which is craftlet dash channel. This week we would like to highlight Alex F., Cynthia, Cindy Weber, Jill Sherrod, and Yauka Jenberg Safont. And I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly because I went and looked it up. I I've heard a lot of names. I had not heard yours before. And it's beautiful and vast and contains multitudes. So please let me know if I pronounced it correctly because I really dig your name. Hello, how are you? I was doing really well. I had a really solid, good two weeks. And then Saturday happened and I I couldn't get out of bed for two days, which really bites. This week's episode in its brevity, will make up for last week's episode in its mammoth gargantuan size. So I, I hope that helps. Today, though, I have an episode called Point and Pickin', and the reason is this. I'm going to play something for you on the screen. I'm going to do a screen capture. So if you're watching on YouTube, you will be able to watch the screen capture. If you are listening to the podcast version, please follow the spoken instructions. And they go like this. If you are on a small portable mobile device, such as a phone or a tablet that claims to be smart, here's what I want you to do. Open something that allows you to type, like your messages or an email. Tap so that you can actually begin typing. Type something. It does not matter what. Realize, oh golly, in the middle of what I just typed is something that I don't want in the middle. (laughs) So you can try and put your finger and tap and hold and drag the cursor. This may work better on Androids than it does on iPhones, but I'm on an iPhone 13 and I want to make this phone last as long as I can. But one of the things that happens is the new operating systems don't work as well with older phones. So one of the things that's become very difficult to do is tap and then move your fingers so that you can get to the middle of a word to make an edit. And then I learned something, which Rebecca, who's on our Thursday night calls and who you will hear more from uh, soon, I think, she already knew this. I did not. Some of you, I'm sure, will know this. Again, news to me, thought I'd share. Once you've typed something and you say, oh gosh darn it, in the middle of that word, I need to remove that letter. Tap on the space bar, hold your finger on the space bar, and you will notice that the entire keyboard just became a trackpad. And now you can move your finger around as though it were a trackpad to get to wherever you need to get to within that text field. And you can let go when you get there and make your edits and Bob's your uncle. So you're welcome. I I picked that up on a random iPhone short. I have been meaning to mention it to you guys for a long time. I, I apologize for how long it took me. What this means is I hope this saves you some time and some frustration in your life because who needs more of that, right? Okay, the picking part, because it's point and picking, is I know we have people who listen to this episodes to this show and who know about Mary Boone's Pickin'. I did not. She's kind of the Elizabeth Zimmerman of the dressmaking world. 
And I bring her up because number one, we're going to put a picture of her on the screen on YouTube. She's just unbelievably gorgeous. In a time when I don't think a whole lot of cosmetics were being used, she's just, just beautiful. I, there's no, there are no other words. She just is. And, and not only beautiful facially and physically, but there's something about her writing too that is, it's old fashioned and and vintage ish, but like Elizabeth Zimmerman, she's, she is so committed to making difficult things easier for the rest of us. And her, her jam is sewing. So as a professional writer, book writer, uh, for sewing books, she has outdone herself. I can't remember. I know it last night. I don't right now. Just how many books she authored. I think it's upwards of 40. In Scranton, Pennsylvania, there was the Women's Institute I will put a link out to the information so you can see who they were and what they did and all this stuff. But Singer Sewing Machine Company put out at least four, I know there were more, but they put out four dressmaking books. One, well, not dressmaking books. One was on dressmaking, one was making children's clothes, one was making things like draperies, and one I think was pattern drafting. She was responsible for all of them. They are all gettable on Internet Archive. I will make sure you have links to to those as well. And they're marvelous. And I know I have heard of other sewists on YouTube talking about several vintage dressmaking books, sewing books that are like the big book of sewing, but they're like from the 40s. And so all of the techniques that get mentioned in vintage patterns, some of them we don't really do anymore, probably because we're lazy, but also I think the terminology's changed somewhat in some of these techniques. So I believe I found a Mary Boone's Pickin 1949 book on dressmaking. I think it's the right one, but I am positive that someone listening is going to know more about this than I do. And that's simply because my brain exploded. I couldn't do enough reading about her like a lot of women of her day, there was a lot less self-promotion. Heather said, looking at herself in the mirror and shaking her head, there was a lot less self-promotion. And, you know, nobody was writing biographies about her or anything, but people have written PhDs about her and those are accessible on the internet as well. So she's fascinating. Her writing style is really accessible. I think I already said that. If you've been interested in sewing or frustrated by sewing in the past, take a look at these little singer books. They're free. They're downloadable. And several of her books that are not free on Internet Archive, you can check out for an hour at a time. As long as nobody else is reading the book at the very same time, you can check it out. So yeah, I love finding these people. If you know more really cool women who did things like this in our crafty world, whether it's knitting or sewing or ceramics or jewelry making or whatever, gardening, anybody who's written really beautifully and clear about these topics, please let me know. You can send that to heather at craftlit.com or 206-350-1642 and let us know. And then I can share your audio on a podcast. So that's the the point and picking part of the episode. The other thing I wanted to make sure you knew is that we are still, during the month of July, raffling off the ever-so-lovely bookmark and coaster sets, two of them from Susan. Thank you, Susan. You can sign up for that raffle by following the link in the show notes, both here and on YouTube. And I forgot to mention last week, (laughs) I had other things on my mind, that next Thursday, Thursday the 25th, is going to be the Big Sleep movie watch party. And I've been noticing that many of you have been taking advantage of the Patreon option of upping your patronage for that month when you want to participate in either the the book party or the watch party. 
And that makes me so happy because I get to see you, which is awesome. It feels like finally technology is doing something that isn't evil. So it makes me very happy to get to see you guys. So yeah, big sleep watch party. And I got to tell you, I rewatched the movie. I was really quite surprised that they were able to pull the humor out. The book is funny. There are funny bits in the book, but so much of Raymond Chandler is absolutely determined by his outrageous use of similes. They still managed to, to make parts of it funny. There are still parts that are cringe because women, but aside from that, Humphrey Bogart's really quite funny. And it's nice. It's not, it was a nice difference for seeing him as that instead of a gangster or African queen, which I love. I'm not throwing shade on African Queen. I love that movie. So yeah, that's the 25th. That's next Thursday. That's going to be the night before our following episode comes out. That'll be, oh my God, it's going to be episode 666. Should we just skip 666 and go to 667? I think we need to have a poll. Let's do a poll. I'd be perfectly fine skipping 666 and just going straight to 667. We can put up a text post saying, yeah, no, and move along. Let me know what you think. It could be truly annoying if you're on a podcatcher that needs uh, the number codes, but it's also kind of funny. All right. The raffle, the big sleep, Mary Boone Pickin, Emma. So I wanted to read to you a uh, part of an email from Julie T in, um, who I met, uh, years ago, like 2011. Uh, I met her when I was in Minneapolis. So I was very excited. She reminded me, I'm like, Oh my God, I remember you. Just made me happy. But she wrote, I had thought about this phrase, the phrase about unbroken cards cards come in sealed decks and you break the seal to open them. That guarantees they haven't been marked or tampered with. No one worries about that when playing for fun, but it matters if you're playing for money. I wonder if making the point that the cards are unbroken implies gambling and is another nod to the difference between the company Mrs. Elton has been keeping and the society at Highbury. I am convinced that Julie is 100% right. I, I can tell you what happened in my brain while I was saying the unbroken part out loud is my brain could only see plastic shrink wrapped shrink wrapped decks of cards and i was like I, that can't they didn't have they didn't have shrink wrapped and they didn't have plastic so uh, clearly my brain is wrong what i forgot was things like cigar wrappers and and the cigarette wrappers and things like that that it absolutely would have been the kind of thing that you would need to do with a deck of cards cuz you're not going to have like a little plastic case for it uh, to put paper bands, probably even sealed if it was a really expensive deck of cards with sealing wax to uh, close that sucker up. So yes, I am positive that it's breaking the seal is, is exactly what Julie had to say. So thank you for that. All right, today we're going to do the last two chapters of volume two. So this is chapters 35 and 36, or volume two, chapters 17 and 18. Last week, I wanted to get those three chapters out together because Mrs. Elton vibe was being introduced to us. And, and really, those three chapters were the arc of her introduction to Highbury and society. Now, in our next two chapters, she's been there long enough that, and I know this is going to shock you, she's making her presence known more forcefully. She is pushy, I guess, is probably the nicest way to describe her. You are going to want to put sharp things under her fingernails. She's, she's just awful, but in a marvelous Jane Austen way. So listen for, you know, we've had quirks with people's speech. Harriet has her spoken quirks. Elton had his spoken quirks. 
if you listen to her language, she is speaking very frequently in modern language. Like, oh, I excessively love that. Well, that was actually slang at the time. And that just would have been a culture clash. Like she's, she is not proper in her understanding, her awareness, her, her manner, all of this stuff. And the people reading the books at the time would have known that. There are actually several things in these chapters that people would have known that have been, well, certainly lost on me. I did not know these things before. There are also some more fabulous Dickensian names. We have Mr. Suckling. We have Mrs. Bragg, B-R-A-G-G-E. I love them. They're all, all of these names, the Dickensian names are attached to Mrs. Elton somehow, which says everything you need to know. These are the chapters where we also get to hear from Jane Fairfax, who is destined to be a governess, a little bit more about the way governesses were hired. If you've read any biographies of the Bronte sisters or Agnes Gray or, or anything that really has, or Jane Eyre, although less so for reasons you'll see, you know that being a governess really stunk. And you were expected to have all of the knowledge and refinement and level of perfection that a woman of a higher class would have, but you are not being paid at that rate that one today would expect for that kind of quality. And it is not accidental that Jane Fairfax is going to make it clear that going to work as a governess is kind of like being sold into slavery. And she's not talking about chattel slavery, obviously. But there are reasons why she's bringing it up this way. At one point, she says, well, they're selling women who are, are having to go into being a governess. There are offices who handle those transactions, who find you a position. Offices for the sale, and then there's an M dash, not quite of human flesh, and then there's an M dash, but of human intellect. Ouch. She doesn't say slavery, but Mrs. Elton responds as though she did. And remember, Mrs. Elton comes from Bristol. Bristol was a port city that had uh, a lot of doings with the, the slave trade. So Elton knows that other people know this, and she's a little titchy about it. Then Jane Fairfax also mentions advertising offices. These aren't advertising offices the way that we would think of them. They're more like placement agencies. Even today in like New York City, there were agencies that would screen candidates and uh, if you were a parent who wanted a nanny, you'd go to them and they'd tell you who was available. This goes obviously way back. And the thing that's interesting in the annotation here is that these offices, these advertising offices did not last long. This was not a growth industry. You would think it would be like if you had really well screened candidates and you place them, that you would have a great reputation and that people would spread the word and come back to you and you would be able to place more people and that would be great. And that is not what happened. What happened is they were kind of fly by night. They claimed to screen people, but they didn't. And so these advertising offices were constantly closing and opening and closing and opening and they were very shady. And I am positive that many of them took payment that was supposed to go to the governesses. And yeah, that didn't happen. So that's what Jane Fairfax is talking about when she when she talks about the advertising offices in relation to, to being a governess. We also have the use of the word nice again, that is actually twice in these chapters, that is closer to what Mr. Woodhouse said before when he said, I think I'm being too nice. I'm being a little too precious and precise or particular. And it's being used exactly the same way in these chapters but I shall be a little more nice doesn't mean I'm going to be a little kinder. It's I'm going to be a, a little bit more particular about things. I already mentioned excessively as some slang. You're also going to hear cara esposa again, misgendering a mister, which I still just get such a kick out of. But, oh, and I hope you watched that video from the linguist that I shared last week. He's really language Jones. He's very interesting. I like him a lot. I like his no... BS attitude. That's always nice. Along with the slang thing, you're going to hear, obviously because of Mrs. Elton, you're going to hear more conversations about modern manners and kind of, they don't say old-fashioned, but they mean previous generations' manners. 
oh, they were so stuffy. Look at how much easier going we are. So there's that take on things. There's also, oh, they were so polite. And in our pursuit of easygoing manners, we are now rude to each other. I will let you decide which way Jane is falling on this question, but modern ease in society would indicate that you talk about subjects that are not appropriate for polite society and that you use slang. So just keep that in the back of your mind. There's going to be a reference to a white and silver poplin dress, and that is a, a faint, a, a plain dress fabric, but it has really fine horizontal ribbing. I think it's not tux. I think it is actual weft threads that are thicker, occasionally thrown in, you know, on a count level, I think. But it, it is a thing, the white and silver poplin. Actually, the ribbing probably would have been the, the silver parts. Anywho, the second time you hear the word nice used in, in this particular way, um, it's going to be nicety, which is particularness, discernment, being able to judge something appropriately. Clifton. Bath was a spa town. Clifton was a spa town. I did not dig into research yet, and so I apologize to anyone who lives in or loves Clifton. Part of the reason that Clifton gets mentioned by Mrs. Elton is that would have been a familiar place to her. It is a, a spa town whose success and the city's wealth was largely grown out of the slave trade. So again, Jane Austen's people reading this at the time, when they heard Clifton, their ears would have perked up because they would know that it, it has the same connotation as coming from Bristol, just to keep that in mind. I'm sure it's a lovely place, and hot springs or hot wells are always appreciated in my book, but, but yeah, that's, that's what we're supposed to be walking away with. You will, conversely, you will hear the phrase uh, plantation being used, uh, an immense plantation. This is not Tara. Although maybe this is why I kept thinking Tara when I heard Maple Grove, because it's in a conversation referencing Maple Grove. But a plantation would just, would just have been a wooded parkland area on somebody's, somebody's estate. Um, I think of plantations as being big farms. Here specifically, we're talking about woods. I always say a woman cannot have too many resources, and I feel very thankful that I have so many myself as to be quite independent of society. But I want to thank one of our listeners for having predicted that this would come up again on a YouTube comment <laughs> saying, but of course she's perfect. What? Why, why ever would you think that she didn't have all the resources? Capital A, capital T, capital R. It was funny. There's going to be a reference to putting on Hyman's saffron robe. This is a reference. So Mrs. Elton refers to the Greek goddess Hymen in a cliched way, but specifically talks about before Hymen's saffron robe would be put on for us. And I started digging. Okay, so Hymen, H Y. Mien is the Greek god of marriage. That makes sense. But a lot of the links that I was finding referred to Hymenea, which is H-Y-M-E-N-A-E-A. -E -E this is a particular kind of tree that actually turns out to be really important. You are probably going to hear more about this if you haven't already. It's been very good with filtering greenhouse gases, and it is part of what's being used to bring back parts of the rainforest that have been destroyed. So that's kind of cool, but that's not the point. I went looking because I couldn't figure out why saffron robes. What's up with saffron robes? Wah. I couldn't find anything, except I did find a picture of the Hymenaea flower. And it has a dark saffron exterior to the, the flower once it's burst open. 
and the the inside is yellow. It is not really saffron yellow, but it's pretty. So we will put a picture up on the screen for you so that you can see what this looks like. And, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. The other thing about the Hymenia flower or the, the plant is its leaves come in clusters of two, which is where the marriage part of the symbolism comes in. So I, I'm pretty sure that they're related. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, either way, happy to learn about the plant and, and see these really gorgeous flowers. So I hope you enjoy that. Close to the end of our second chapter today, you're going to hear Mrs. Elton mention somebody coming from Birmingham, and she's not impressed. She says, Birmingham, which is not a place to promise much, you know. This is pot, meat, kettle. Because while Bristol, where she comes from, was known for the slave trade, Birmingham was a, a huge and amazing industry, uh, industrial center for the British. Industrial Revolution. That, however, gets to the heart of the North and South conflict that we read with Gaskell's book, where the the North was considered to be, especially by people in the South, to be dirtier and and more toxic because smokestacks and all of the things that come along with industrialization. So that is not imagined if you perceive that as being a slight. That is what Mrs. Elton is trying to get across. You can hear a use, we've heard it before in other books, I think, but it's not very common. Do not physic them. Do not give them medicine. Don't call a doctor every time the kid sneezes. And evidently this goes back to John Locke. John Locke was really against uh, over-medicating children and, and medicating not just like with medications that you would ingest, but also medical treatments. And when you think about what was going on at the time, with bleeding and and other things, purgatives, things like that. John Locke was probably onto something. <laughs> May not have been great to do some of those things to small children. So that was Mr. John Knightley talking to Emma because he's about to leave the children with her for a little while. You are also going to hear Emma use the word dissipation. She is using this and it is modern slang, and she is using it on purpose in a, a kind of a, a melodramatic way. I will read you why Jane Austen puts that in her mouth at the end of today's episode. Along with our email from Julie, we also got a voicemail. She has a, a point to make about the Coles inviting Emma to their party and the social niceties surrounding that. But she also has some information on how the YouTube algorithm responds when I give you the instruction to fast wind to some particular time code if you wanted to listen to your own version of the book. So we're going to play for you now. And then when we get back, we will listen to our chapters. Hello, Heather. This is Corviday. Just finished up episode, the uh, chapters of 24 and 25, where Emma is being all weird about the Coles having a party and be like, oh my God, I can't believe that they had the right, or they felt they were entitled to invite me. Oh wait, they didn't invite me? And I'm sending the letter later being like, oh, we didn't want to invite you until we knew that we could accommodate your father, who we know is going to come out anyways. Didn't sound like they, like, I don't think they were being... Oh, yeah, it didn't sound like they were sincere. I don't think they were being rude or sincere. I think they were more like they knew Emma's view on their standings in society, and so they weren't going to invite her because they knew that she probably finding it as an insult. And then I'm guessing Mrs. Weston, def like, in my, in my mind, definitely mentioned something to them, and they were like, oh, okay, oh, we were just trying to accommodate your father, who we know is not going to show up anyway. Um, it didn't sound like, oh, yeah, we just forgot to do it or we were going to wait to make sure we could accommodate him. Sounded kind of sus, as they say. And, oh, last thing, when people are watching you on YouTube and you say, if you want to skip ahead to this point to catch up to us, if you're listening elsewhere, I um, think you should know that in the YouTube algorithm, if people are skipping over 
your content, it's counted as sort of a penalty, and your stuff is not suggested as much to other new people. So what I've been doing is I watch your YouTube up until the point, and then I turn the sound down, and on a different device, I listen to the the one you recommended. I can't remember her name, but the other version that you recommended to find, and let that play through on YouTube so you still get sort of, I guess, the credit for it being watched all the way through. And that, um, and it's even better if people rewind and rewatch parts that gives more points towards it. Just a thought to put out there. But if they want to help uh, craft it out a little bit, just put it on in the background. You can just turn your volume all the way down. Let it run through. So I hope you are feeling well, Heather, and I'm going to keep listening. All right. Let's listen to Volume 2, Chapters 17 and 18, or Chapters 35, 36 of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version, you can let this play if you're listening on YouTube and watching on YouTube, or if you are listening on a podcast catcher, please fast wind to one hour and two minutes. All right, here we go. Volume 2, Chapter 17. When the ladies returned to the drawing-room after dinner, Emma found it hardly possible to prevent their making two distinct parties. With so much perseverance in judging and behaving ill did Mrs. Elton engross Jane Fairfax and slight herself. She and Mrs. Weston were obliged to be almost always either talking together or silent together. Mrs. Elton left them no choice. If Jane repressed her for a little time, she soon began again— and though much that passed between them was in a half-whisper, especially on Mrs. Elton's side, there was no avoiding a knowledge of their principal subjects. The post-office, catching cold, fetching letters, and friendship were long under discussion, and to them succeeded one which must be at least equally unpleasant to Jane, inquiries whether she had yet heard of any situation likely to suit her, and professions of Mrs. Elton's meditated activity. "'Here is April come,' said she, I get quite anxious about you. June will soon be here. But I have never fixed on June, or any other month, merely looked forward to the summer in general. But have you really heard of nothing? I have not even made any inquiry. I do not wish to make any yet. Oh, my dear, we cannot begin too early. You are not aware of the difficulty of procuring exactly the desirable thing. I not aware, said Jane, shaking her head. "'Dear Mrs. Elton, who can have thought of it as I have done? "'But you have not seen so much of the world as I have. "'You do not know how many candidates there always are for the first situations. "'I saw a vast deal of that in the neighbourhood round Maple Grove. "'A cousin of Mr. Suckling, Mrs. Bragg, had such an infinity of applications. "'Everybody was anxious to be in her family, for she moves in the first circle. "'Wax candles in the schoolroom. "'You may imagine how desirable.' Of all houses in the kingdom, Mrs. Bragg's is the one I would most wish to see you in. Colonel and Mrs. Campbell are to be in town again by midsummer, said Jane. I must spend some time with them. I am sure they will want it. Afterwards I may probably be glad to dispose of myself, but I would not wish you to take the trouble of making any inquiries at present. Trouble? Ay, I know your scruples. You are afraid of giving me trouble. But I assure you, my dear Jane, the Campbells can hardly be more interested about you than I am. I shall write to Mrs. Partridge in a day or two, and shall give her strict charge to be on the lookout for anything eligible. Thank you, but I would rather you did not mention the subject to her. Till the time draws nearer, I do not wish to be giving anybody trouble." "'But, my dear child, the time is drawing near. "'Here is April and June, or say even July is very near, "'with such business to accomplish before us. "'Your inexperience really amuses me. "'A situation such as you deserve and your friends would require for you "'is no everyday occurrence, is not attained at a moment's notice. "'Indeed, indeed, we must begin inquiring directly. "'Excuse me, ma'am, but this is by no means my intention.' I make no inquiry myself, and should be sorry to have any made by my friends. When I am quite determined as to the time, I am not at all afraid of being long unemployed. There are places in town, offices, where inquiry would soon produce something. 
offices for the sale, not quite of human flesh, but of human intellect. Oh, my dear, human flesh? You quite shock me. If you mean a fling at the slave trade, I assure you Mr. Suckling was always rather a friend to the abolition. I did not mean—I was not thinking of the slave trade, replied Jane. Governess trade, I assure you, is all that I had in view. Widely different, certainly, as to the guilt of those who carry it on, but as to the greater misery of the victims, I do not know where it lies. But I only mean to say that there are advertising offices, and that by applying to them I should have no doubt of very soon meeting with something that would do. "'Something that would do?' repeated Mrs. Elton. "'Ay, that may suit your humble ideas of yourself. I know what a modest creature you are. But it will not satisfy your friends to have you taking up with anything that may offer, any inferior, commonplace situation, in a family not moving in a certain circle, or able to command the elegancies of life. You are very obliging, but as to all that I am very indifferent. It would be no object to me to be with the rich. My mortifications, I think, would only be the greater. I should suffer more from comparison. A gentleman's family is all that I should condition for. I know you, I know you, you would take up with anything, but I shall be a little more nice, and I am sure that the good Campbells would be quite on my side. With your superior talents you have a right to move in the first circle. Your musical knowledge alone would entitle you to name your own terms, have as many rooms as you like, and mix in the family quite as much as you choose. That is, I do not know— if you knew the harp, you might do all that, I am very sure. But you sing as well as you play. Yes, I really believe you might, even without the harp, stipulate for what you chose. And you must and shall be delightfully, honourably, and comfortably settled, before the Campbells or I have any rest. You may well class the delight, the honour, and the comfort of such a situation together, said Jane. They are pretty sure to be equal— However, I am very serious in not wishing anything to be attempted at present for me. I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mrs. Elton. I am obliged to anybody who feels for me. But I am quite serious in wishing nothing to be done till the summer. For two or three months longer I shall remain where I am, and as I am. And I am quite serious too, I assure you, replied Mrs. Elton gaily, in resolving always to be on the watch, and employing my friends to watch also, that nothing really unexceptionable may pass us. In this style she ran on, never thoroughly stopped by anything till Mr. Woodhouse came into the room. Her vanity had then a change of object, and Emma heard her saying in the same half-whisper to Jane, "'Here comes this dear old beau of mine, I protest. Only think of his gallantry in coming away before the other men. What a dear creature he is! I assure you I like him excessively. I admire all that quaint, old-fashioned politeness. It is much more to my taste than modern ease. Modern ease often disgusts me. But this good old Mr. Woodhouse, I wish you had heard his gallant speeches to me at dinner.' Oh, I assure you, I began to think my caro sposo would be absolutely jealous. I fancy I am rather a favourite. He took notice of my gown. How do you like it? Selina's choice. Handsome, I think, but I do not know whether it is not over-trimmed. I have the greatest dislike to the idea of being over-trimmed. Quite a horror of finery. I must put on a few ornaments now, because it is expected of me. A bride, you know, must appear like a bride. But my natural taste is all for simplicity. A simple style of dress is so infinitely preferable to finery. But I am quite in the minority, I believe. Few people seem to value simplicity of dress. Show and finery are everything. I have some notion of putting such a trimming as this to my white and silver poplin. Do you think it will look well?' The whole party were but just reassembled in the drawing-room, when Mr. Weston made his appearance among them. He had returned to a late dinner, and walked to Hartfield as soon as it was over. He had been too much expected by the best judges for surprise, but there was great joy. Mr. Woodhouse was almost as glad to see him now as he would have been sorry to see him before. John Knightley only was in mute astonishment. That a man who might have spent his evening quietly at home after a day of business in London should set off again and walk half a mile to another man's house for the sake of being in mixed company till bedtime, of finishing his day in the efforts of civility and the noise of numbers, was a circumstance to strike him deeply. 
a man who had been in motion since eight o'clock in the morning, and might now have been still, who had been long talking and might have been silent, who had been in more than one crowd and might have been alone, such a man to quit the tranquillity and independence of his own fireside, and on the evening of a cold, sleety April day rush out again into the world. Could he by a touch of his finger have instantly taken back his wife, there would have been a motive, but his coming would probably prolong rather than break up the party. John Knightley looked at him with amazement, then shrugged his shoulders and said, "'I could not have believed it even of him.' Mr. Weston, meanwhile, perfectly unsuspicious of the indignation he was exciting, happy and cheerful as usual, and with all the right of being principal talker, which a day spent anywhere from home confers, was making himself agreeable among the rest, and having satisfied the inquiries of his wife as to his dinner, convincing her that none of all her careful directions as to the servants had been forgotten, and spread abroad what public news he had heard, was proceeding to a family communication, which, though principally addressed to Mrs. Weston, he had not the smallest doubt of of being highly interesting to everybody in the room. He gave her a letter. It was from Frank, and to herself. He had met with it in his way, and had taken the liberty of opening it. "'Read it, read it,' said he. "'It will give you pleasure. Only a few lines will not take you long. Read it to Emma.' The two ladies looked over it together, and he sat smiling and talking to them the whole time, in a voice a little subdued, but very audible to everybody. "'Well, he is coming, you see. Good news, I think.' "'Well, what do you say to it? I always told you he would be here again soon, did I not? Anne, my dear, did I not always tell you so, and you would not believe me? In town next week, you see, at the latest, I dare say, for she is as impatient as the black gentleman when anything is to be done. Most likely they will be there to-morrow or Saturday. As to her illness, all nothing, of course. But it is an excellent thing to have Frank among us again, so near as town. They will stay a good while when they do come, and he will be half his time with us.' This is precisely what I wanted. Well, pretty good news, is it not? Have you finished it? Has Emma read it all? Put it up, put it up. We will have a good talk about it some other time, but it will not do now. I shall only just mention the circumstance to the others in a common way. Mrs. Weston was most comfortably pleased on the occasion. Her looks and words had nothing to restrain them. She was happy. She knew she was happy, and knew she ought to be happy. Her congratulations were warm and open, but Emma could not speak so fluently. She was a little occupied in weighing her own feelings, and trying to understand the degree of her agitation, which she rather thought was considerable. Mr. Weston, however, too eager to be very observant, too communicative to want others to talk, was very well satisfied with what she did say, and soon moved away to make the rest of his friends happy by a partial communication of what the whole room must have overheard already. It was well that he took everybody's joy for granted, or he might not have thought either Mr. Woodhouse or Mr. Knightley particularly delighted. They were the first entitled, after Mrs. Weston and Emma, to be made happy. From them he would have proceeded to Miss Fairfax, but she was so deep in conversation with John Knightley that it would have been too positive an interruption, and finding himself close to Mrs. Elton, and her attention disengaged, he necessarily began on the subject with her. End of chapter 17 Volume 2, Chapter 18 "'I hope I shall soon have the pleasure of introducing my son to you,' said Mr. Weston. Mrs. Elton, very willing to suppose a particular compliment intended her by such a hope, smiled most graciously. "'You have heard of a certain Frank Churchill, I presume,' he continued, "'and know him to be my son, though he does not bear my name.' "'Oh, yes, and I shall be very happy in his acquaintance. I am sure Mr. Elton will lose no time in calling on him, and we shall both have great pleasure in seeing him at the vicarage. You are very obliging. Frank will be extremely happy, I am sure. He is to be in town next week, if not sooner. We have notice of it in a letter to-day. I met the letters in my way this morning, and seeing my son's hand, presumed to open it, though it was not directed to me, it was to Mrs. Weston. She is his principal correspondent, I assure you. I hardly ever get a letter. And so you absolutely opened what was directed to her. Oh, Mr. Weston, laughing affectedly, I must protest against that. A most dangerous precedent indeed. I beg you will not let your neighbours follow your example. Upon my word, if this is what I am to expect, we married women must begin to exert ourselves. Oh, Mr. Weston, I could not have believed it of you. Ay, we men are sad fellows. You must take care of yourself, Mrs. Elton. 
This letter tells us, it is a short letter, written in a hurry, merely to give us notice, it tells us that they are all coming up to town directly on Mrs. Churchill's account. She has not been well the whole winter, and thinks Enscombe too cold for her. So they are to all move southward without loss of time. Indeed, from Yorkshire, I think. Is Enscombe in Yorkshire? Yes, they are about one hundred and ninety miles from London, a considerable journey. Yes, upon my word, very considerable. Sixty-five miles farther than from Maple Grove to London. But what is distance, Mr. Weston, to people of large fortune? You would be amazed to hear how my brother, Mr. Suckling, sometimes flies about. You will hardly believe me. But twice in one week he and Mr. Bragg went to London and back again with four horses. The evil of the distance from Enscombe, said Mr. Weston, is that Mrs. Churchill, as we understand, has not been able to leave the sofa for a week together. In Frank's last letter she complained, he said, of being too weak to get into her conservatory, without having both his arm and his uncle's. This, you know, speaks a great degree of weakness. But now she is so impatient to be in town that she means to sleep only two nights on the road. So Frank writes word. Certainly delicate ladies have very extraordinary constitutions, Mrs. Elton. You must grant me that. No, indeed. I shall grant you nothing. I always take the part of my own sex. I do, indeed. I give you notice. You will find me a formidable antagonist on that point. I always stand up for women, and I assure you, if you knew how Selina feels with respect to sleeping at an inn, you would not wonder at Mrs. Churchill's making incredible exertions to avoid it. Selina says it is quite a horror to her, and I believe I have caught a little of her nicety. She always travels with her own sheets. An excellent precaution. Does Mrs. Churchill do the same? Depend upon it, Mrs. Churchill does everything that any other fine lady ever did. Mrs. Churchill will not be second to any lady in the land, for— Mrs. Elton eagerly interposed with— "'Oh, Mr. Weston, do not mistake me. Selina is no fine lady, I assure you. Do not run away with such an idea.' "'Is not she? Then she is no rule for Mrs. Churchill, who is as thorough a fine lady as anybody ever beheld.' Mrs. Elton began to think she had been wrong in disclaiming so warmly. It was by no means her object to have it believed that her sister was not a fine lady. Perhaps there was want of spirit in the pretense of it, and she was considering in what way she had best retract, when Mr. Weston went on. "'Mrs. Churchill is not much in my good graces, as you may suspect, but this is quite between ourselves. She is very fond of Frank, and therefore I would not speak ill of her.' Besides, she is out of health now, but that, indeed, by her own account, she has always been. I would not say so to everybody, Mrs. Elton, but I have not much faith in Mrs. Churchill's illness. If she is really ill, why not go to Bath, Mr. Weston? To Bath, or to Clifton? She has taken it into her head that Enscombe is too cold for her. The fact is, I suppose, that she is tired of Enscombe. She has now been a longer time stationary there than she ever was before, and she begins to want change. It is a retired place. A fine place, but very retired. Aye, like Maple Grove, I dare say. Nothing can stand more retired from the road than Maple Grove. Such an immense plantation all round it. You seem shut out from everything, in the most complete retirement. And Mrs. Churchill probably has not health or spirits like Selina to enjoy that sort of seclusion. Or perhaps she may not have resources enough in herself to be qualified for a country life. I always say a woman cannot have too many resources, and I feel very thankful that I have so many myself, as to be quite independent of society. Frank was here in February for a fortnight. So I remember to have heard. He will find an addition to the society of Hybra when he comes again. That is, if I may presume to call myself an addition. But perhaps he may never have heard of there being such a creature in the world." This was too loud a call for a compliment to be passed by, and Mr. Weston, with a very good grace, immediately exclaimed, "'My dear madam, nobody but yourself can imagine such a thing possible. Not heard of you. I believe Mrs. Weston's letters lately have been full of very little else than Mrs. Elton.' He had done his duty and could return to his son. "'When Frank left us,' continued he, "'it was quite uncertain when we might see him again, which makes this day's news doubly welcome.' It had been completely unexpected. That is, I always had a strong persuasion he would be here again soon. I was sure something favourable would turn up. But nobody believed me. He and Mrs. Weston were both dreadfully desponding. 
How could he contrive to come, and how could it be supposed that his uncle and aunt would spare him again, and so forth? I always felt that something would happen in our favour, and so it has, you see. I have observed, Mrs. Elton, in the course of my life, that if things are going untowardly one month, they are sure to mend the next. Very true, Mr. Weston, perfectly true. It is just what I used to say to a certain gentleman in company in the days of courtship, when, because things did not go quite right, did not proceed with all the rapidity which suited his feelings, he was apt to be in despair, and exclaim that he was sure at this rate it would be May before Hymen's saffron robe would be put on for us. Oh, the pains I have been at to dispel these gloomy ideas, and give him cheerfuller views! The carriage! We had disappointments about the carriage. One morning, I remember, he came to me quite in despair." She was stopped by a slight fit of coughing, and Mr. Weston instantly seized the opportunity of going on. "'You were mentioning May. May is the very month which Mrs. Churchill has ordered, or has ordered herself, to spend in some warmer place than Enscombe, in short, to spend in London, so that we have the agreeable prospect of frequent visits from Frank the whole spring, precisely the season of the year which one should have chosen for it. Days almost at the longest, weather genial and pleasant, always inviting one out, and never too hot for exercise. When he was here before, we made the best of it, but there was a good deal of wet, damp, cheerless weather. There always is in February, you know, and we could not do half that we intended. Now will be the time. There will be complete enjoyment, and I do not know, Mrs. Elton, whether the uncertainty of our meetings, the sort of constant expectation there will be of his coming in to-day or to-morrow and at any hour, may not be more friendly to happiness than having him actually in the house. I think it is so. I think it is the state of mind which gives most spirit and delight. I hope you will be pleased with my son, but you must not expect a prodigy. He is generally thought a fine young man, but do not expect a prodigy. Mrs. Weston's partiality for him is very great, and, as you may suppose, most gratifying to me, she thinks nobody equal to him. And I assure you, Mr. Weston, I have very little doubt that my opinion will be decidedly in his favour. I have heard so much in praise of Mr. Frank Churchill. At the same time, it is fair to observe that I am one of those who always judge for themselves, and are by no means implicitly guided by others. I give you notice that as I find your son, so I shall judge of him. I am no flatterer." Mr. Weston was musing. "'I hope,' said he presently, "'I have not been severe upon poor Mrs. Churchill. If she is ill, I should be very sorry to do her injustice but there are some traits in her character which make it difficult for me to speak of her with the forbearance I could wish. You cannot be ignorant, Mrs. Elton, of my connection with the family, nor of the treatment I have met with. And between ourselves, the whole blame of it is to be laid to her. She was the instigator. Frank's mother would never have been slighted as she was, but for her. Mr. Churchill has pride, but his pride is nothing to his wife's. His is a quiet, indolent, gentleman-like sort of pride that would harm nobody, and only make himself a little helpless and tiresome. But her pride is arrogance and insolence. And what inclines one less to bear, she has no fair pretense of family or blood. She was nobody when he married her, barely the daughter of a gentleman. But ever since her being turned into a Churchill, she has out-churchilled them all in high and mighty claims. But in herself, I assure you, she is an upstart. Only think! Well, that must be infinitely provoking. I have quite a horror of upstarts. Maple Grove has given me a thorough disgust to people of that sort, for there is a family in that neighbourhood who are such an annoyance to my brother and sister, from the airs they give themselves. Your description of Mrs. Churchill made me think of them directly. People of the name of Tupman, very lately settled there, and encumbered with many low connections, but giving themselves immense airs, and expecting to be on a footing with the old established families. A year and a half is the very utmost that they can have lived at West Hall, and how they got their fortune nobody knows. They came from Birmingham, which is not a place to promise much, you know, Mr. Weston. One has not great hopes from Birmingham. I always say there is something direful in the sound, but nothing more is positively known of the Tupmans, though a good many things, I assure you, are suspected. And yet by their manners they evidently think themselves equal even to my brother, Mr. Suckling, who happens to be one of their nearest neighbours. It is infinitely too bad. Mr. Suckling, who has been eleven years a resident at Maple Grove, and whose father had it before him, I believe at least, I am almost sure that old Mr. Suckling had completed the purchase before his death. They were interrupted. 
tea was carrying round, and Mr. Weston, having said all that he wanted, soon took the opportunity of walking away. After tea, Mr. and Mrs. Weston and Mr. Elton sat down with Mr. Woodhouse to cards. The remaining five were left to their own powers, and Emma doubted their getting on very well, for Mr. Knightley seemed little disposed for conversation. Mrs. Elton was wanting notice, which nobody had inclination to pay, and she was herself in a worry of spirits which would have made her prefer being silent. Mr. John Knightley proved more talkative than his brother. He was to leave them early the next day, and he soon began with, "'Well, Emma, I do not believe I have anything more to say about the boys, but you have your sister's letter, and everything is down at full length there, we may be sure. My charge would be much more concise than hers, and probably not much in the same spirit. All that I have to recommend being comprised in, do not spoil them, and do not physic them. I rather hope to satisfy you both, said Emma, for I shall do all in my power to make them happy, which will be enough for Isabella, and happiness must preclude false indulgence and physic. And if you find them troublesome, you must send them home again. That is very likely. You think so, do not you? I hope I am aware that they may be too noisy for your father or even may be some encumbrance to you if your visiting engagements continue to increase as much as they have done lately. Increase? Certainly. You must be sensible that the last half-year has made a great difference in your way of life. Difference? No, indeed, I am not. There can be no doubt of your being much more engaged with company than you used to be. Witness this very time. Here am I come down to one day only, and you are engaged with the dinner-party. When did it happen before, or anything like it? Your neighbourhood is increasing, and you mix more with it. A little while ago, every letter to Isabella brought an account of fresh gaieties, dinners at Mr. Cole's, or balls at the Crown. The difference which Randall's, Randall's alone, makes in your goings-on is very great. Yes, said his brother quickly, it is Randall's that does it all. Very well, and as Randall's, I suppose, is not likely to have less influence than heretofore, it strikes me as a possible thing, Emma, that Henry and John may be sometimes in the way, and if they are, I only beg you to send them home. No, cried Mr. Knightley, that need not be the consequence. Let them be sent to Donwell. I shall certainly be at leisure. Upon my word, exclaimed Emma, you amuse me. I should like to know how many of all my numerous engagements take place without your being of the party, and why I am to be supposed in danger of wanting leisure to attend the little boys. These amazing engagements of mine, what have they been? Dining once with the coals, and having a ball talked of, which never took place. I can understand you, nodding at Mr. John Knightley, your good fortune in meeting with so many of your friends at once here delights you too much to pass unnoticed. But you, turning to Mr. Knightley, who know how very, very seldom I am ever two hours from Hartfield, why you should foresee such a series of dissipation for me, I cannot imagine. And as to my dear little boys, I must say that if Aunt Emma has not time for them, I do not think they would fare much better with Uncle Knightley, who is absent from home about five hours where she is absent one, and who, when he is at home, is either reading to himself or settling his accounts. Mr. Knightley seemed to be trying not to smile, and succeeding without difficulty upon Mrs. Elton's beginning to talk to him. End of chapter 18 End of volume 2— Alright, going back to the beginning of our chapters today, you may have been surprised when you heard Mrs. Elton responding to the sale of human flesh the, the governess comment that Jane Fairfax made, you may have been surprised that her immediate response was to jump to abolition, whereas another woman who was aware of what happened to governesses probably would have just stuck with talking about governesses and the plight. They wouldn't have necessarily jumped straight to slavery. I will not be implying here that Jane Fairfax did not mention the sale of human flesh as a dig to Mrs. Elton, because I'm 98% sure that that is our one true moment so far of Jane Fairfax snark. She's a, a little titchy about the whole slavery thing. And it, it makes sense that similarly to people whose families may have owned property in the South would be very careful 
nowadays to make it clear, but they never owned slaves, as though implying that they were therefore against slavery and that all of the modern praise for holding that position should be imbued upon the landholder. Jane Fairfax, along with the snark moment, Jane Fairfax really fights back. God bless her. We saw this start last week, and she's just not having any. And I love her all the more for it. When Mr. Knightley was talking about her not having an an open disposition and being too reserved, she's now starting to shed that veil. And it's all because of Mrs. Elton. So thank you, Mrs. Elton, for opening Jane up. The whole thing about, wow, well, I mean, you, you play piano beautifully and you sing and you read and speak and write so lovely. But maybe if you could play harp, I could get you into a really good family. Oh, my God. But does it have to be a piano? Hmm. Harps were considered elegant. Harps were also rare. Fewer people played harps than played piano. She's just trying to think of selling points for Jane. I wrote, you go girl, (laughs) in the margin. Mrs. Elton is pushing that the Campbells, neither the Campbells nor she would be able to uh, rest until Jane was situated properly. Fairfax then says, you may well class the delight, the honor, and the comfort of such a situation together. They are pretty sure to be equal. Meaning, there will be no delight, honor, or comfort in being a governess. It's all going to be the same bad. However, I am very serious in not wishing anything to be attempted at present for me. I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mrs. Elton. I am obliged to anybody who feels for me. But I am quite serious in wishing nothing to be done until the summer. For two or three months longer, I shall remain where I am and as I am. Why would I sell myself into this horrible profession before I have to? You know, it's calm down, Mrs. Elton. Seriously, really calm down. And go Jane. I just thought that was marvelously done on her part. Uh, Did you crack up when you heard Mr. John Knightley talking again about somebody leaving their family and traveling when they could have been staying at home, having a nice night? I just, he's such a homebody. And again, the other characters have some of the, the verbal cues excessively for Mrs. Elton. And here we have... Mr. John Knightley, always going back to home and hearth, which I kind of love. You may have been surprised by the, that Mr. Weston talked about the impatience being as, as impatient as the black gentleman. Now we've heard language like this before. This is obviously a reference to the devil or Satan. And, you know, the reasons why our legion and I am not at all qualified to comment on them, except this stuff always makes me really sad and uncomfortable. However, there is another thing going on here. The impatience part. She's as impatient as Satan. Satan wants your soul. Satan is itching to get at your soul. That's where this impatience thing comes from. And it's, it's actually that phrasing, the impatience of a black gentleman, is used in poetry. I also still love that that Mr. Weston is so enthusiastic that even though he is talking specifically to little nodes of people all around the room, everybody's already heard it. Everybody's already heard his news. He's effusive, ebullient, loud, but happy. I also, this is one of those things that's on, on paper, not something that you can hear. In quotation marks, it is part of the quoted section, but then it is also inside parentheses. So it's a little parenthetical comment on how this is being said. Mr. Weston says, Mrs. Weston is the principal correspondent. I assure you, I hardly ever get a letter. And that's about Frank Churchill coming back. And Mrs. Elton says, and so you absolutely opened what was directed to her? Oh, Mr. Weston, laughing affectedly. M dash, parenthesis, laughing affectedly close parenthesis. I must protest against that. And you can just see like fake laugh. Like, oh, Mr. Weston, ha 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 ha. I must protest that. You can tell how much I hate this woman. Ah, like I said, Miss Bates comes off much better than other characters in the book. 
especially Mrs. Alton. I thought it was it was also interesting when we finally hear Mr. Weston talking about the Churchills and his sister-in-law in particular. And Jane Austen is using italics here. The evil of the distance from Enscombe, said Mr. Weston, is that Mrs. Churchill, comma, italics, as we understand, comma, has not been able to leave the sofa for a week altogether. So he's not buying any of this. And then Weston goes on to say, but now she's so impatient to be in town that she means to sleep only two nights on the road. And then he says, certainly, delicate ladies have very extraordinary constitutions, Mrs. Elton. You must grant me that. It's hard to know what Mr. Weston is saying here. Is he saying extraordinary constitutions because it is extraordinary how different your constitutions are from men, or extraordinary because you seem to claim to feel lousy when clearly you don't, all the kind of belief in hysteria and things like that, or extraordinary as in extraordinarily delicate, weak, but then every so often you rise to the occasion and show some fortitude. I don't know. It could be all of that together. But either way, that idea of the extraordinary constitution is something that was part of the larger discussion in the world, uh, especially since Mary Wollstonecraft wrote Vindication on the Rights of Women. I also love that Weston, now that he's kind of spewing everything about Mrs. Churchill, Mrs. Churchill is not much in my good graces, as you may suspect, M- dash, but this is quite between ourselves. No, it's not. No, it's not. The whole world knows. The whole world knows how you feel. I guarantee you the whole world knows how you feel, Mr. Weston. I'm glad you think that you've been so discreet about the whole thing. I'm I'm starting to think that we need to start a drinking game. Every time Maple Grove gets mentioned when Mrs. Elton is around, take a drink I, it, of anything. It could be tea. It could be water. It could be a reminder to, hi- to hydrate yourself. But either way, I think we would all be better hydrated if every time she mentions Maple Grove, <laughs> we have a drinking game. At the same time that Mr. Weston can drive me crazy sometimes, he is also, I mean, Mrs. Elton is begging for a compliment. This was too loud a call for a compliment to be passed by, and Mr. Weston, with a very good grace, immediately exclaimed, My dear madam, nobody but yourself could imagine such a thing possible. Not heard of you? I believe Mrs. Weston's letters lately have been full of very little else than Mrs. Elton. He had done his duty and could return to his son. (laughs) Said the nice thing to the woman who's clearly desperate. Let's get back to Frank. I also I also love that Mrs. Elton is stopped by a slight fit of coughing and Mr. Weston instantly sees the opportunity to go on. Got to take those moments when you can get them. Break in. I also love that Mr. Weston talks about uh, Mrs. Churchill out Churchilling all of them in her high and mighty claims, but in herself, I assure you, she is an upstart. Well, of course, Mrs. Elton is going to take offense at this. That must be infinitely provoking. I have quite a horror of upstarts. But she doesn't take offense at it in exactly the way one might have hoped. She doesn't see herself in that comment at all. And and that's a really beautiful piece of characterization, of indirect characterization, where we learn a lot about her by how she doesn't respond. And she doesn't just start there. She keeps going and digs her hole even deeper. Uh, People by the name of Tupman moved in near Maple Grove, very lately settled there and encumbered with many low connections, but giving themselves immense airs and expecting to be on the footing with the old established families. A year and a half is the very most they could have lived at West Hall, and how they got their fortune, nobody knows. They came from Birmingham, which is not a place to promise much, you know. Yeah, this woman has no mirror no clarity. It's just shocking. And then if if that wasn't all enough of a giveaway, when she talks about Mr. Suckling having lived there for 11 years, which again, when you think about Hartfield, they've been there forever. Mr. Suckling's been 11 years at Maple Grove, which is a blink of an eye for them, and whose father had it before him. 
M dash, I believe, comma, at least, M dash, I'm almost sure that old Mr. Suckling had completed the purchase before his death. So the whole been there 11 years thing is kind of, maybe I'm going to change the subject now. And they were interrupted by the tea coming around. Lucky for her. I also thought it was very interesting that Jane Austen put some insight, real insight into Emma, into Mr. John Knightley's hands, talking about how very much her life has changed since Miss Taylor got married and became Mrs. Weston and moved to Randall's. That Emma's Emma is out in, out in the boot a lot more than than she was before. And that is not information that we could have known because of the way the book starts. So that's just giving us a little bit of background that Emma really has been quite cloistered in her life. And so some of her social faux pas, faux pas, fox pas, zzz, are very likely due to the fact that she really has not had to mix with a lot of other people. We know that there used to be dances held in Highbury. There haven't been for a really long time. So yeah, Emma's a more complicated character than than I had originally thought. And I did promise that I was going to read to you a selection from a, a letter. And we've read from this before. Jane Austen wrote a very famous letter to her niece, Anna, who wanted to be a writer herself. And I think she did actually publish Anna had sent Jane Austen uh, drafts of her novel, and this is what Jane wrote back in part about Anna's main character, Devereux Forrester. Jane says, Devereux Forrester being ruined by his vanity is extremely good, but I wish you would not let him plunge into a, quote, vortex of desperation, unquote. I do not object to the thing but I cannot bear the expression. It is such a thorough novel slang, and so old that I dare say Adam met with it in the first novel he opened. Adam, the first man in the first novel that he opened. She doesn't, she doesn't mind the thing. A vortex of dissipation. Dude, excellent. Great character work. Go for it. Don't call it that. Calling it that is a cliche, and a cliche as old as Adam. It is. It breaks my heart all the time that Jane Austen's letters uh, to Cassandra were burnt because I'm sure that they were. There had to be some real dingers in there, hum dingers. All right, that is it for us for today. Next week, the 25th is the Big Sleep Watch Party. If you are interested in joining us, please make sure you are signed up properly over at Patreon.com. You need to be at the Mina Harker tier. And if you are subscribing through the app or through YouTube or any other way that you've you've donated money to Craftlet at that same tier level, please contact Eric, E-R-I-K, at craftlet.com, and he will hook you up on the Discord server. And if you haven't joined the Discord server and you're on Patreon, please do. Um, there are lots of memes flying over there all the time that are fun and very bookish. And lovely having access to everybody there. And don't forget to follow the link in the show notes if you want to join the Christmas in July bookmark exchange. We've been doing this uh, Christmas in July several, several years in a row now. And Tracy is still doing the hard work for us and coordinating who gets which name to send bookmarks to. So if you're interested in both making and receiving a little bookmark gift, this summer, please, please, please sign up today, the day that this episode is released. Tracy will get your sendy name and address to you as soon as she can. And then uh, the sending deadline is, I think, August 9th. So that gives everybody about three, three and a half weeks. Also, big sleep next Thursday. That would be the 25th of July 2024. If you're on Patreon at the Mina Harker level, then you should already have access through the Discord server. If you are new to Patreon, just check for a little post on Patreon telling you early next week how to get on the Discord server and 
and how to set yourself up so that you are able to join the watch party. So yeah, next week, big sleep, big fun, no whammies. All right, have a good week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.